it's really wonderful to be here with all of you. It's, it's one of those things where I think you can just come to church, right? And you just can kind of feel like, oh, it's just another day. We're going to show up, and in the morning we're going to go through the same process. And I just really hope you don't feel that way. Um, we are here, we gather together because we want to know the God who made us, the God who, who chose to come in the likeness of human flesh to die for us so that we could have a relationship with Him again. And if you believe that, that's true of you. You've been brought from death to life. You've been brought out of darkness into the marvelous light. And that's why we're here. And when we fellowship, when we talk and we laugh together and we cry together, all that is in the context of the fact that Jesus Christ did something amazing to you through his death and resurrection. So I hope that this isn't another day. Oh, just another Sunday. I really hope that we would believe this morning what God has actually done. Because that's going to matter. That's going to matter as we look through the rest of Romans. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for us, pray for myself, because I have no idea really what the Lord would have for us this morning. But I'm going to pray for us, and I encourage you to pray with me before we begin looking at God's Word. Lord, my desire right now is to be changed. My desire right now is to look at your Word and to not just hear what it says and walk away like a man looking at himself in the mirror and not remembering what he looks like. I want to look at this word today. I want to look at your word, your words to me, your words to us, your words to the Roman Christians at the time. God, I want to look at this, and I want it to pierce my heart and change me. I want it to change all of us. I want us to be different when we leave today compared to how we were when we walked in. That the struggle with sin, God, that we all face, that we would feel a little more helped in that. That we would feel like we have ammunition to fight against the devil. That we would feel like we have the protection that we do really have in Christ. That we would know things about you that are true. I would just plead with you this morning, Lord, that you would not let the words that are spoken by me or the lyrics that we sing in these songs or just even the text of, your, of this Bible, God, that none of that, none of that would happen and just be void and useless, but that, God, that your spirit would be here and would work and that we would be different as a result of this morning. So Lord, I thank you that I get to be here, that we all get to be here, that this little fellowship right now, Lord, that, that we are about our Father's business. And I would just ask God, if there's anyone here who has yet, who has yet to join you in that relationship, yet to believe in the gospel of Christ, God, that you would somehow, by your power, not by my ability or my persuasion or whatever else could come from me or from anybody else today, God, that you, by the power of your word, would bring that person to faith. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So I pray, God, that you would speak to us this morning through your word. Amen. All right, well, if you guys have your Bibles, please open them or swipe to them <laughs> or push on a little app button, whatever you got to do to get to the Word of God and go to Romans chapter 6. Uh, you'll remember last week that Jack shared with us, and I just want to encourage you to, uh, Jack is with Kelly and one of their kids. Which kid is it? Ellie, Ellie thank you. <laughs> um, I looked over there because... Kelly's family's here, um, but they are both in Africa, so please, please pray for them. Um, that's just, they're going to be there for a little while, so pray for them. Um, if you think about it, I also got an email from my former exchange student, Helen, if you guys remember her, and she's actually in Cambodia, or traveling to Cambodia right now to serve people there for the sake of Christ. So that's pretty incredible. So if you guys think of her, you can pray for her as well. Um, and I could talk about that all day, but I'm not going to. 
uh, Romans 6, Jack shared with us in Romans 5 just what it means to be in Adam and in Christ and how different that is. It's just two different worlds, and we're going to look at that more today. So Romans 6, 1 through 14, Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin, he died once once for all. But the life he lives, he he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Now for those of you who Come to some of you all the time. We usually have the verses up here on the screen. The computer's crashed like two, two or three times already this morning. So you've got to look at your own Bible. hope that's okay. But I just want to, in case any of you are like waiting, you know, you kind of had that longing. When is, when is the first going to show up? It's not going to show up. Okay. So don't, don't, don't bother. I'd rather, you know, just focus on the word and you can look at me and whatever. Um, but so... Paul is transitioning here, and he says, okay, what shall we say then? Given all that stuff in Adam, it's condemnation and all these things, and in in Christ is grace and all those things. He says, what shall we say then? Here's an objection, right? An objection to all this grace, this scandalous grace. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And he's basing that off of what he just said in Romans 5.20. But he says, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So someone's going to read that and say, okay, well, cool. That means I can just sin. And the more I sin, the more I offend God, the more I can show that his grace was given to me, and the more glory he'll get in the end, right? Because his grace will be just this profound thing, you know, like, wow, look at what God has done that I can just sin and sin and sin and sin. Look at his glory. Look at how amazing it is. And Paul says, no, by no means. How could we say that? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? I mean, does that mean that it's okay to sin because of grace? And really, as I've been thinking about this, some, a question popped into my mind is, okay, do I really take sin seriously? Uh, John Owen, a, a pastor long, 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 long time ago, uh, actually wrote a lot on killing sin. He, the book's titled The Mortification of Sin. And, and they took this seriously. We've got to put sin to death. We've got to destroy it. We, gotta, we don't want to just kind of give in and just kind of go through the motions and we'll sin a little bit and no big deal. They took this seriously. And I was just asking myself, okay, have I fallen into this false idea in the way that I live? Have I fallen into this kind of false concept? Am I practically living this way? Where it's like, okay, I can continue doing this sin. It doesn't offend me as much. Or God's going to forgive me for it anyway. So I'll just choose that. And that's a really important question to ask. Because Paul says, are we to do that? He says, no. By no means. No way. What kind of question is that? So then Paul asks a question following that as the foundation of his argument against that thinking. This is, this is what he says. He says, how can we, Christians, those who have been redeemed by Christ, how can we who died to sin still live in it? So we really have to think about this in kind of a two-kingdom mentality, okay? 
probably the easiest way to think about this. There's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom that's under Adam, that's sin. Okay, sin is the, is the master of that kingdom. And then there's the kingdom of grace. And never are you going to live in both. You're either going to live in one or the other. Okay, so there's two kingdoms, sin and grace. And Paul's saying, how can we who have died to sin still live in it? So if you've died as a citizen of one country, you're no, re- you're no longer really a citizen of that country once you die. Now we know that sometimes dead people vote during the election cycle. Somehow that happens, okay? Um, <laughs> but in, in reality, when you die, you're no longer there. You're somewhere else. And even when you move to, say, a different country, So if I were to move to China, for instance, if I move there, I can learn the language, I can, can, you know, really enjoy the food, I can really partake in a lot of those things, but I'm from a different kingdom, so it's going to take me a little while to get used to that new kingdom. I'm going to have to live in this different place. I'm almost dead to being a citizen here and alive to being a citizen here. Now, this is important because what Paul's not saying is he's not saying that when we're dead to sin, that we will no longer sin. And that's where some kind of the errors come into this, is people will read this and say, okay, well, I can reach perfectionism, sinless perfection, okay, right? I can, if I live a certain way and I act a certain way, I'll never sin again. That's not what Paul's saying. He knows that we still struggle with the flesh. We still struggle with the old man. So we will still sin. But what he is saying is that we are dead to sin and the fact that we are dead to its power and reign and rule over us. It's, it's putting us in slavery to it. Now, if you've been a Christian for any number of years, you forget about this because you've been living under Christ for so long that you don't remember what it was like to really live in sin and have no concept of grace whatsoever. You're just living for yourself. You're selfishly pursuing you. And what you want, and you're just living in that opposition to God. But Paul's saying, you have already died. Christians have already died through Christ to that old way of living, that old kingdom. So, well, whoa, what does that mean? That's, I still sin, Paul, come on. I, I still do that. What do you mean I'm dead to it? You are dead to the power. Like if you lived under this king, if you live under this sin king, and he's telling you, okay, you gotta, you're going to be under my, you're going to obey me, you're going to be under my rule. When you die from there, you're moving to a different kingdom. And Paul's going to flesh that out here. So in, in verse 3, he continues on and says, do you not know? Meaning, this is a foundational truth, what I'm about to say. And you're going to notice this as we continue on. He's going to say, we know, we know. Do you not know? Focus in on those. Underline those in your Bible because that means that this is a core understanding of what it means to be a Christian. So he says, do you not know that all of us, all Christians, all people who are of Christ, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now something really important to note is remember how I've mentioned in the past how important past tense is? This is used in what's called the aortist aortist verb. So it's something that's past that is certain. It's not a question. It's not something that will continue. This isn't a part of sanctification. This is something that's already happened. So do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, it's something that's happened to you. It's not something that's continuing to happen. It's something that's happened to you. We're baptized into his death. Now, real quick, I just want to make a point here. The main point of this passage, and so, so many people just, what do you, when you read this, what do you immediately start thinking about? Paul's going to start talking to us about baptism. No, I'm not. Because <laughs> that's not the point. The point here is not to get off on a diatribe about the importance of baptism and how you know, we should all be baptized. That's not necessarily the focus here. The focus is on union with Christ, on the fact that we are united with Christ. We've been baptized into him. That doesn't mean that when we get baptized, we, are, we become one with Christ. It, when he says we were baptized into Christ, it means we were immersed into him. We became fused with him. We are with Christ entirely. 
which means that his life, his death, ends up being ours. And when it says that we've been baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. What happened when Jesus died? Now, this is really important that we first, we don't look at ourselves immediately, but when we look at this passage, we have to think, okay, what, did, what happened to Jesus? Because whatever happened to Jesus, now we're united with him, that's going to be true of us. That's going to be true of us. So what happened in Jesus' death? Sin was defeated. Sin was defeated. The power of sin, the, the, the reign of sin was defeated. So if that's true for Christ, then that's true for you. That's true for you. The reign of sin over you to make you obey it, to, to have you just continue in it and, and be just totally burdened by it and weighed down by it and enslaved to it, imprisoned by it, that's gone if you're in Christ. And that's the key word, in Christ. He died, defeated sin, which means sin has been defeated on our behalf as well. And I love this because he continues on and he, he takes it even further. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism, by baptism into death. So what happens when someone's buried? Not many of us will ever be buried alive, thankfully. But typically when you're buried, you're already dead. And when somebody dies and you put them in the ground, there's really no hope that they're going to come back, <laughs> Right? You know, once it's buried, there's a finality there. It's over. It's gone. That person is really, really dead. There's no, no change there. So he's saying we were, you and I as Christians, we were buried with him. Sin is dead. It's gone. That, that power over you is totally gone because you were buried with Christ. You were dead with Christ. It was It was final. And why was that? In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now this, is, this passage is actually really quite thrilling, and I will not do it justice this morning. But this is a really exhilarating passage, and you just stop and meditate on it for a while. Because if you think about it, two things have happened. Because we're with Christ, because we're in Christ, death has been defeated Sin has been defeated. We're no longer slaves to sin. But in addition to that, something amazing happens. Christ was raised from the dead, which means we too will be raised from the dead. And how does that happen? By the glory of the Father. Can anyone in here raise themselves from the dead? Does that, do any of you have the power to do that? We try, right? We try to like go on diets and eat healthy and do everything we can so that, you know, maybe we'll live longer or whatever. But the fact is we can't avoid death. It's going to come. It's going to come. And we need, we, we want to live forever. Nobody really wants to die. And here we see we have that hope, we have that possibility because by the glory of the Father, by the power of God, we can be like Christ raised from the dead. This is not normal. If you try to look at this through like a natural lens, you're just not going to get it. This is a supernatural power that's happening. And we have to think that way in order to get this. And so Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, and because of that, we too might walk, we might live our lives in newness of life. When you look at your life, do you think, I have a new life in Christ? That I have really been made new? You think of the verse, the old is gone, the new has come. Do you ever think about that? How often do you fall into that old way of thinking? How often do you fall into that idea of, I, you know, okay, I'm just a wretched sinner and there's no hope for me? That's not what salvation was meant to do to you. That's not what the cross was meant to do to you. The cross was meant to show you that, yeah, that was true of you, but now you've been brought to life. Right now, Christian, you have new life in Christ. This isn't something you long for and wait for, like, okay, I'm going to get to heaven and finally I'm going to have this new life. No, he says, we too get to walk in newness of life. That's a reality now. That's now. 
That's now. And he's going to keep going on with this. He, he makes the main point here of this statement where he says, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Do you realize how great Jesus is in this statement? Do you realize this? Does this matter to you at all? That the only reason, the only reason that you can have new life is because Christ was raised. The only reason that you have freedom from sin is because Jesus died. And he, he was, is your representative. And he lives for you and he died for you in your place. And that becomes you. That becomes your lot. Have you thought about that? Have you reflected on that? Do you think about that when you wake up in the morning? This is how I'm going to live my day because I know what's true of me. I know who I am in Christ. I think so often we try to live as if Jesus did something and, and it's really great and it's really wonderful, but we don't really think of the reality that we are actually in him, that we are bonded with him, that we are one with him, just like in a marriage you become one flesh, that we are one with Christ. This great Savior that we love so much, he's actually one with you. That is a, a really amazing thing. So then he moves on, and he starts talking about the death to the old self and freedom from slavery to sin. So again, verse 6, what does he start it with? We know. So underline that. We know this. We know this. This is a core Christian truth. We know. We don't doubt this. We're not worried about it. We don't kind of wonder about it. We know that our old self was crucified with him. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So we know that our old self was crucified with him. That basically just means that who we, are, who we were before, that old man, that old self, living just totally for ourselves, living for the world, living for everything that was just opposed to God, that that old person, that old self, was crucified. It was crucified. It was killed. The power of that, the weight of that is gone. How was it crucified? It was crucified with him again. The importance of being in Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Like I said a minute ago, I think, I think when we think of sin, it can become such an out of sight, out of mind thing. And we don't want to just if you focus too much on your sin and just become so self-aware of your sin, it's just hard to even function. So you're like, gosh, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to get a fight again or I'm going to get angry at this person or I'm going to lie again or I'm going to do this. And you're forgetting about the grace, which is really important to move there. But we have to remember that when we are in sin, we're actually choosing bondage. Do you ever think about that? That when you are, when you are walking into sin, when you're making the choice to sin, you're actually walking into the cage and locking the door behind you. You're actually saying, okay, I'd rather walk in slavery than walk in freedom. But we have to understand that when our old self was crucified, we were set free once and for all. So it doesn't make any sense. Paul's, remember, trying to make this argument. How does, how does it make sense to sin so grace may abound? It doesn't. Because when we've been freed from the cage, why would anyone walk back to it? Why would anyone willfully say, I've been given this freedom in Christ, and so now I'm just going to keep on sinning and get away with whatever I want? That is not compatible. It doesn't make sense because we are no longer enslaved to it. It doesn't have power over us. And then he makes the point, for one who has died has been set free from sin. And this is just hard to grasp because we, we want to sin at times. We want to go back to it. And, you know, when you think of like, so slavery in America, when you think about how slavery worked in America, once, once slavery was abolished, a lot of those slaves would come out of being slaves, and you'd think that, well, they'd just walk into life and everything would be fine. But that wasn't the case. A lot of people who were in slavery struggled with living in freedom. They didn't quite know how to do it. So there was this feeling of, I've only known this life. I've only ever known slavery, and so now I'm free, and I have no idea what that's supposed to look like. 
I have no idea what that's supposed to look like. But that doesn't change the reality. That doesn't mean that they should go back to the next slave master and say, hey, I want to go back to you. It just means that they have to learn now, just like you learn in a new culture, how to live in that new kingdom, that free kingdom. So he continues on. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe, again, core doctrine. This is core, foundational. We believe that we will also live with him. Isn't this wonderful? When you die, Christian, you will live. (laughs) Christian funerals are so bizarre, aren't they? According to the world. I remember when I did Dolores' funeral, um, some of the people who were in attendance at Dolores' funeral actually got upset at me because I shared the gospel. And I had told them, even before I shared it, that, listen, Dolores believed this, <laughs> and she wants you to hear it. That's her wish. And they got mad because I wasn't talking about how sad it was that she was gone, and how I should just, oh, what a horrible thing, and that, that everyone were black, and, and this is just terrible. And yes, there's a time to grieve, and I mourned Dolores' death, as many of us did. But they actually got upset because my focus was not on the mourning, but it was on the hope. When we die, which is the reality that all of us face, not a single person in here, none of you will live forever in this flesh, in this mortal body. You will die. So what happens? You either die or you live forever. I think I'll take live forever with God, thank you very much. If I'm going to choose two doors, I'm going to choose the live forever with Jesus door. I'm not going to choose the live away from him forever door. That doesn't make any sense. So we can believe and we can know that we will also live with him. Why? Not because of any great thing that you or I have done, but because Jesus was raised from the dead. If you think that you're going to be raised from the dead because you did X, Y, and Z, you're going to be so disappointed because you're going to stand before Jesus and he's going to say, I never knew you because you thought you could get here on your own. You said my name. You said Jesus is great. You sang my songs. But you didn't care about what I had actually done for you. You never really believed what I did for you on the cross because you still tried to do it yourself. Oh, my prayer is that none of us would think that way, that none of us would ever stand before Christ at the end when we die. And he says, yeah, sure, you did all these things. You cast out demons. You had a lot of prayer meetings. You showed up to church every Sunday. But you never really, really believed what I did for you. So are we going to believe it? Are we going to know it? That what Christ has actually done when his, with his death on the cross and his resurrection is took our place and we're there with him and so we die to sin and we're raised with him? Are you going to believe that today? I hope so. I hope I believe it. And I don't just fall into the pattern of whoop de doo another sermon. Now I'm out the door and I'm going to go live my life. What a horrible way to live. Horrible way to live. Because I have been set free. We have been set free from sin. And we will live with Christ forever. Because he is alive right now. When Easter comes, right, we get all excited. And we say, he's risen. He's alive. And every other day of the week, it's, yeah, Jesus is all right. He's alive. He's risen. He's not dead anymore. Guys, he's, he's not in the tomb. They can't find his body. He's gone. He's gone. That's what our hope is in. He's not here. He went up into the heavenlies and he's with God, seated at the right hand of God. And that means that if that's true, guess where you will be one day if you believe it? (laughs) And he keeps going. We know that Christ Being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Isn't this wonderful? Once once Christ died and was raised, he defeated death. It was conquered. 
It was conquered. So this fear of, oh, death, the sting of death that we all fear, it's gone. You know, we sing, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? We sing that. Isn't it wonderful? Christ was raised from the dead. He will never die again because death has no dominion over him. For the death he died to sin, he di- or the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. <laughs> once for all. It's finished. It's finished. The power of sin over you, it's finished. And I know, I know the struggle in your mind right now, probably. This is the same in my heart that I've been thinking about. It's okay, it's finished, but I still struggle with it. It's finished, but I still sin. And you have to understand that because we are in the fallen world, because we are in our flesh, because our flesh fights us and we're at this battle, that sin will win sometimes. But it doesn't win the war. It's going to have these little victories over you that are going to make you question whether God died for you or whether Jesus was raised for you. That's what the devil does is he takes those little sins and he convinces you that what Jesus did was not enough. It is enough. It's finished. It's defeated. Sin does not have the power over you to enslave you any longer because Christ killed it. He put it to death. John Owen wrote another book. I love John Owen because his titles are so amazing. You know, The Mortification of Sin. And then he wrote another book called The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. Isn't that an amazing title? In the death of Christ, death was murdered. It was killed. It was completely eradicated for those who are in Christ. And it's once for all. This isn't some weird belief. We don't hold the belief that Jesus dies over and over again and and every time we sin and go to him with confession or whatever, that he dies again for our sins. No, it happened once and for all. And remember, this is aortist tense. I know that's a weird word and I don't want to sound all academic on you or anything, but that's important because it means that it's done. It's not something that continues. It's finished. It's done. Verse 11, so then, okay, so, after all that, right, now what? Now what? Paul, what do we do? How do you see yourself? We really need a proper perspective on our identity, and so that's why Paul says in verse 11, so, you also must, 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 this isn't optional, you must consider yourselves what? Dead to sin. You know how much freedom you would have in a, in a healthy way? Not freedom to sin, but how much freedom you would actually feel and, and have to not have that burden of sin weighing you down of, oh, I failed Jesus again. When is his wrath going to come out and be poured out on me? How many of you feel that way? Where when you sin, you feel like God is just going to crush you, that he hates you now. That is, that is a horrible place to live, and I've, I've actually struggled with that. I grew up Catholic, okay, and nothing necessarily against Catholics, but Catholicism in and of itself reads this type of mentality. If I don't confess enough, if I don't say enough Hail Marys, if I don't have a pretty rosary, whatever it is, if I don't do this, God's not going to love me. But Paul says something different. He says, you must consider yourselves already dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's your identity. How many of you struggle with Christian identity? You don't need to raise your hand. I'm sure all of us from time to time struggle with who we are in Christ. We think, okay, I, I don't have assurance because I, did, I acted out in this way and I did this thing and I did that thing and We really are performance-based, and we think that our ultimate reality is based off of what happens, what we do. We really have to understand that something's been done to us by an outside force, and that's where we get our identity. So my, I have two parents, right, my mom and my dad, 
And if they say to me, Paul, you are our son. Should I believe him? Is that, my, is that where I should get my identity from the people who actually birthed me <laughs> and raised me? Or should I be getting it somewhere else? Should I be thinking about my surroundings and saying, oh, well, all these things happen in my life. Maybe I'm not their son. That's, that doesn't even make any sense. Our identity is that we are dead to sin and we are alive to God. And that is a tremendous amount of fuel for fighting sin when it does come into your life because it will. When the old kingdom begins to call and says, like, do you guys remember the Israelites, what happened to them? They are in Egypt, enslaved, hating life, <laughs> begging for a deliverer. They get delivered, and what happens on the way to the promised land? You know, I think Egypt looks pretty good right now. What is that? The old kingdom calls. The old man calls and says, hey, that doesn't look so good. Come over here. Come back. And if you don't know who you really are, and you don't really know what Christ has actually done for you, you don't know what God's actually worked in your life, that is going to look better going back to that old way of life. So knowing your identity gives you fuel to fight against that temptation to sin the way that you used to. And so now he gives practicals, and this is where we all really care about it, right? We should say, okay, well, that was really good information. What do I do? Well, Paul gives us the answer, thankfully. And so we just get to bank on this, and I'm not going to flesh it out too much. <laughs> but this is how we then live based off of what our identity is, what our perspective is. Verse 12, let not, do not let sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So when sin comes creeping at the door and you're tempted to fall into that sin, you're tempted to choose that, it's what it's doing, it's like, a, it's like you're standing before the king, right? You're standing before the king and he says, Listen, I'm your king. You've got to obey me. I want you to do this and this and this and this and this. And so we've got this king in this, in this sin kingdom who's saying, I want you to be selfish. I want you to be harmful. I want you to do all these things. Don't worry, it's going to be for your good, but I want you to do all these bad things because you're going to feel good when you do them. And so I want you to keep doing it. And Paul's saying that don't let that happen. Don't put yourself before that king. Don't let it reign over you. If the king of the sin kingdom calls you into his throne room, say, I'm not going in. I'm not going in. You can pull at me all you want. You can take your guards and try to drag me in, but I'm going to fight it with everything I have. Because if I listen to you, I will die and I will never see the real king. Ever. Ever. And so we see, let not sin. That's a big deal. Don't let it. Don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions, which are for evil. They're not for good. They look good to you right now, but they are not good for you. Sin is evil. We cannot take it lightly. We cannot say, it's no big deal. If I sin this way, I have grace in Christ. We're falling into that pattern, that wrong thinking. We cannot live that way. And so he continues on then, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness because if you present yourself before the king and you say, use me however you will, and that's the king of sin, you are giving yourselves over to being opposed to the God who created you. That's the life you're choosing. You're saying, use me however you will. You want me to look at porn? I'll look at porn, and I'll just keep looking at porn, and keep looking at it, and keep looking at it, and keep looking at it. You keep offering up your members to that, you keep saying, okay, just one click away, here's my finger, I'm going to click on that, click on that, click on that, click on that. You are giving yourself over to a different king than the one you profess to have saved you. That is a dangerous place to be, and that's why Paul is so emphatic about it here. But then he says, don't do that, but present yourselves to God. Okay, so we're standing before this different king. 
And what's different about this king that's different from the king of the sin kingdom? What's different about this other king? Look at what it says. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. So it was like, you're getting ready to stand before, you've been standing before this sin king your whole life, and you've been given over to him, and then all of a sudden someone comes in, and they say, I'm going to grab you, and they take you, and they haul you off, and they put you before the real king, and they say, I've taken you out of there, and I've put you before this king, and you will forever be before him. You don't live in this kingdom anymore. You're in this kingdom. You have been brought from death to life. And you stand before that king so we, can, we should, instead of going back and standing before this other king that causes us to sin, we should run from that and stand before the God who has done something for us by bringing us to life. That's your king. That's your God. That's your Lord. That's why we call him Lord is because he's better for us. He knows what's right for us. He knows what's true for us. He is the right king, the good king, the humble savior who chose to do that for us. And so he says then, and present your members to God as instruments for righteousness. In the same way, we need to stand before God, and I would just say to do this every morning when you wake up, is that the first thing you do would not be, and I'm preaching to myself here by the way, this is something I, so I'm going to yell at myself for a moment, and you guys should just partake in it because it's probably true of some of you as well. Don't wake up in the morning and look at your phone and say, what got posted on Facebook today? Because it's so important. Don't wake up in the morning and start off your day just getting up and not thinking about how God would want you to live that day. How many of you just wake up and just let your life do whatever it's going to do? And you don't actually ask God, God, help this day to be about you. Help me to actually go to work and and be about you and live for you. Well, we're so tired, right? Which hopefully, are you resting, by the way? Are you resting? I've missed a lot of days of rest. I tell you what, taking the time to rest that I have has been huge for me. It's been huge for me because it puts me in a position where I say, all those other things can take care of themselves, God. I'm trusting you with these 20, 30 minutes. The world will continue to revolve around the sun and all these things will continue to happen regardless of if I'm trying to control my life and everything that's going on. God, it's that, it's that quote, right? God's the, God's the only one who gets his to-do list done every day. We have to understand that God has done this great thing for us, and so the first person we should go to every day is the Lord. And we should say, Lord, here I am. I'm standing in your throne room. What would you have me do today? I've got all my gifts, all my, my, my physical, everything about me, my mind, my body, my emotions, everything, God, I am giving over to you today to use as you see fit for my good and ultimately for your glory. Now, if you did that every morning and you actually made an effort to shut out the world, and I know you're saying, okay, well, I gotta rush to work and all that kind of stuff. Well, you're already off on the wrong foot. If you woke up and you said, Lord, I'm coming to you right now. Use me how you will today and I'm gonna trust you for the day. I have to believe that that will help you in your fight against sin. And it will help you to live for God. So finally, Paul ends the whole thing by saying, this is kind of his answer to the whole deal. Verse 14, For sin will have no dominion over you. Since, because, you are not under law, but under grace. So should we continue in sin that grace may abound? I'm sure, I hope that we can all say together, by no means. Given what Christ has done for me, 
why would I continue in sin thinking that that would abound to his, his glory and his grace when they're totally different kingdoms? We need to fight sin. We need to cling to the one who even brought us to a place where we can fight it. And whenever I, even when I think of making this statement, it kind of freaks me out to say it. But, because I, I just am not trusting. I'm not a trusting person. I don't trust God as much as I should. I can kind of just say things, but then I kind of wonder, well, is that really true? I'm just kind of a skeptic, I guess, naturally. And God's been working on that. Does it freak some of you out when the pastor says that? I, I hope it just helps you understand that I'm a real person. <laughs> I'm just a normal person. I'm just a pastor. This is one part of the church. I'm not better than anybody. The reality is, is that I really believe that as we fight sin, as we take sin seriously, and as we believe what's true about us, our identity, and that we've, been, we've died with Christ and we've been raised with him, that in time, sin will decrease. The, that the power is already gone, but our desire to sin will decrease because we will be looking at and longing for God instead of ourselves. So just finally, I just want to just really remind you guys this. We, we cannot live in two kingdoms, and we never do. You either totally live in the kingdom of sin, or you live in the kingdom of grace. You don't live in both. You, may, you might be in the kingdom of sin and see the kingdom of grace from afar, and steal a couple things from it and try to look like that culture. But you haven't really been brought from death to life by the Savior. Or you live in the kingdom of grace and it's all been done once and for all for you. And you look back like the Israelites did at Egypt and you say, oh, that looks better for a moment and you take it. That doesn't remove you from what Christ has done for you once and for all. Now granted, if you... You say, well, what about the person who just continues in sin and is unrepentant? Well, in time, they're going to show which kingdom they really live in. You don't have to judge that. You're going to see it. You're going to see that over time. So, think of what you've been given in Christ. Think of how you've been freed from the slavery of sin and been brought in freedom in Christ. And let's pray together. I'm going to pray for you, and then please take time to pray together and just ask God, to, God how do I, I, I believe this, but what does that mean for me every day? Help me, help me in this. So let me pray for you, and then you can pray together.